to receive our morning tithes and offering. Let's go to the Lord. God, we just come to you this morning. Oh, we come to you, our Heavenly Father. And Lord, we thank you that you have always taken care of us. God, that you always provide for us and you will always love us. And this morning, we just give back to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Yeah, we, we had a wonderful vacation, and Josh, thank you for filling in for me last week. Uh, we were down at Myrtle Beach. We had so much fun. I laughed at those guys that were walking out there with crispy critter sunburns, and I said, boy, are those guys idiots. Those guys are, you can't fix stupid. So I went out on Friday with the family because they all just wanted to go out and play in the water. And so I went out and laid down, and I was only going to be out there about an hour, and I was. And I got up, and I said, boy, are you stupid. <laughs> went to bed that night, and all these oils and aloes and alloys and all that stuff. Kathy reached over to give me a good, good night kiss. I said, don't touch the body. <laughs> Every nerve fiber in my body is in pain. Oh, I am sure glad I waited till the end of the week to do something stupid. Is this still working? Yeah, it is. Well... I sat down and was thinking with all my grandbabies and my kids. And I thought, boy, Lord, that word if keeps coming back to my mind. When I was younger, I used to think of, boy, if I could do it over again. Anybody ever been there? If I had to do it all over again, what would I change? How often I've thought about that. One thing, if I could do it over again. If you could do it over again, what would you change? Hmm? If you had it all to do over again, what would you change as a dad? And I wrote down about eight things, and then I narrowed it down a little, and I might have gotten it down to five. I may not even get through five. Because as awesome as God has been in my life, how incredible he has blessed me when I didn't deserve being blessed sometimes. The favor of God. And I think back, and one of the things I have often desired to be able to say at the end of my life, I have no regrets, but that's not true. I do. And I think today in this day and age where social the so society and the social media and everything just wants to pour out all the trash on dad, on men. We live in a day that the world wants to discourage us, and I want to encourage us today. I'm going to air some soiled laundry to you because I think sometimes... Some of you have loved me so undeservedly with such an agape love that I oftentimes feel unworthy. And I say that humbly because I love you and I am so proud of you as men in this fellowship. Because if we have ever lived in a day when it could be discouraging to be a man, to be a husband. It's today. It is. So if you could go back, would you do some things differently? I probably think you would. Yeah, I do. Being a parent's a hard thing. And kids don't come with instruction manuals, and we don't have universities we go to to learn how to be parents. 
But I want to lay out before you a few things that I have learned over the years, having been a dad now 43 years, having taken on another family, another generation. Brody and Chris are 43 and 41. Now I'm into a generation of 29 and 27 and 23. Got another generation coming behind that. Got one little Blakely, and she is about an hour and four minutes. No, she is a four, year and four months. Absolutely has won my heart. And I have thought about how I'm going to love her. She's the one that comes in, and I walk out of the bedroom, and she's out in her little high chair and a, eating breakfast, and the first thing she does is go, And I walk over and I go, and her little nose goes out to get touched. You know where that started? On FaceTime. Really. On FaceTime, Kathy would have it up there and we'd be talking. She couldn't hardly talk. She couldn't talk. And I'd go, and touch the screen and her little nose would go toward that screen. And when she's in person, her little nose goes to the finger. You think you don't impact a child? Whew, you sure do. I walked up to her and I said, honey, give, give Papa a headbutt. <laughs> She's, I think she likes it. <laughs> I got to make sure I got the hard part of my head there because she doesn't, she doesn't temper it. <laughs> she has, like some of you, she has no filter. Bump. And uh, laugh. If she asked me for the moon, I'd go find it. I would. She is that. She's won my heart. Now we got a little boy coming. He's still in the womb. Katie Bug was over. She made spaghetti for us last night. Oh, coming home from the beach, not having to cook. I love that moment. <laughs> Kathy didn't have to cook. <laughs> but, uh, but it was wonderful celebrating babies coming into the world all the way down to not even out of the womb. November is going to be a real Thanksgiving, I'm going to tell you, because that's when she's come. he's coming. So we got a little boy, got a little girl, spans a whole bunch of time. What a wonderful thing to be a father and a grandfather. What a responsibility. And when I was going through the, the sermon and going through my thoughts and going through the scriptures, Paul spoke to the family many times in Ephesians and Colossians. The first part of those chapters up front are all about doctrine and about the behavior in the church. But when he gets to the last part, he gets into the practical applications. And in both of those books, in Colossians and in Ephesians, he speaks to the family. The order that God has given us, the order of relationships, and I, I'm going to use both Ephesians and Colossians and maybe some others as I go because you could go to Proverbs and write the whole sermon. But we are living in a misinformed society, a world that promotes everything else except respect and reverence for God. So when I say to you dads, thank you for choosing to be in the house of the Lord, that's a huge statement for me. It's not as a pastor. It's as a man who understands that without God, we're lost. So I want to consider five things if I get to them. I'm not going to keep you here all day. Could, because we ain't having service tonight. And I really want to preach. Y'all are a captive audience. Lock the doors. But I want to share five things. And the first one starts in Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm going to use the New Living Translation. But in verse 28, there's a passage. And it's pretty strong. And being that this is Father's Day, in the same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. Men, how many of you like your own body? A couple of you do. I'm proud of you. Really, think about it. 
If I had loved my body, I would not lay in that stinking heat for an hour without something covering me. Because it hurt. You don't want to hurt your own body. Huh? How many love your body? Y'all are just not being honest. Because the Bible says if I love my wife the right way as Christ loved the church, I am loving my own body. Now, the world we live in, it doesn't show much love for one another. There's a lot of men who hate their own body, obviously, because they beat on their wives. They treat them harshly. They don't give them any liberty. That is not God's word. But what I do know is if I will love my wife as Christ loved the church. I mean, listen to those words. They're so explicit. He says, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. Wow. You know what I know? If a man will love his wife like Christ loved the church, willing to lay his life down for her, she will die for him. Fact. You say, oh, pastor, I don't know. No, I, I do know that. I do know that. See, you know how I know that? Jesus laid his life down, and he was with his disciples, and every one of them was willing to give their life for him. If that's true with men, I want you to know some of the women who God has given them the, the desire to be close to be one, they'll do the same. They'll do the same. Husbands, in Colossians it says, verse 19, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Wow. Men, I need to tell you something. You know this, but we need to have it reiterated. Next to God... Loving your wife is the greatest and most important thing you can ever do. Fact. See, if I will love God and honor his word and live it out in my life, and as he loved the church, and he says to you and me to love our wives like he loved the church, the reality is, we have set the greatest example for our children and for their children. The greatest thing I can do for my kids and my grandkids is to love mother, love my wife. And after leading those babies to Jesus Christ, whew, you set your priorities. Some people have set their kids as number one priority. I mean, know that. Well, I'm only staying with their dad because I've got kids still in the house. Yucky. What a terrible reason to stay. Life is way too short. And it's way too long to live that way. God wants us to live in a relationship that is healthy vertically and then healthy horizontally. And this relationship, husband and wife, is the foundation that God gave for the family. Amen. Go all the way back to Genesis. I won't have to read it for you. But the reality is God wants us to love our wives above everything else except him. And you know what I know? It, there's a danger that we men can get into. We don't too often get too often into this. But the reality is if we're not careful, we can set our wives on a pedestal and we can worship them. And God said, don't worship them, but love them like Christ loved you. We worship him. We adorn him. But we can pour out love and passion and commitment and all the good things that God the Father gives us on them. And we ought to. We ought to. 
There's no holding back. There is no, this is yours and this is mine. No, that's not how God set it up. Isn't it amazing when we're single, we want to pour out all kinds of nice things on the woman that we cherish so she knows that we cherish, and then we get married, and all of a sudden, that stops? Hmm? You know, I believe God wants us to romance our wife every day. The women said amen. <clears throat> it's not like Bill, when he and Kathy got married, <laughs> he knows where I'm going. <laughs> Kathy says, you don't tell me you love me all the time anymore. He says, <laughs> Bill says, I told you at the altar, and if it ever changes, I'll tell you that too. <laughs> Bill, tell her you love her. <laughs> he said, I did once. <laughs> the funny part of it is, though, there's times when we, we need to say it. Hmm? You know what I know? Every time you tell your sweetheart how much you love her and how special she is, you're putting pennies in the bank. So when the hard times come and you have to withdraw from the bank, there's enough there that will carry you through. True story, true, true evidence. Out in California, oh, this is back in the 80s. They did a study. This is hard to imagine because when I first read it, I said, they cannot be right. And they studied about how people, they can predict with 95% accuracy whether a family, a husband and wife are going to be together after five years or not. True. They said in that, that finding in that article, they said if 95 out of 100 comments you make to your spouse are positive and reinforcing and loving statements, even if it's a tough thing to address. 95% probability you'll still be married five to 10 years down the track. Now watch that. Watch this. If only 90% are positive, reinforcing, loving statements in all of your conversations... It's 95% that within five years you'll be divorced. Five comments that are different can change your family. You think words are important? They are. They're vitally important. How you speak to your wife is absolutely essential. How you express your love to her. I looked up that word that they use here, love your wives in Colossians and in Ephesians, and that word is, is the word agape. Unconditional love. Unmerited favor upon them. Too often we treat our wives like, you've got something to give me, I want it, give it to me. That's not how God did it. No. That Greek word, actually means a sacrifice of yourself for the other. Give of yourself. Love her unconditionally, even if it's not being reciprocated, because it will be one day. Christ loved his church. And if we love our wives like Christ loved the church, She'll never have a problem in submitting to you. The scripture says to us in chapter 5, again, right up in front, in verse 22. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As a church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. You know what I found? Now, ladies... Here's one of those things that's valuable, but you may not want to hear it. One of the struggles that men have is control. And we love to control things that we want to control, but we don't want to have to control things that aren't important to us, and we don't know it. 
Children, when they are born, for that first dozen years or so, are under the direct influence of mom. Dad, your task in life is to support her, encourage her, stand with her. Even if she's wrong, you stand with her. Those babies need to hear about a, a standard, and it may not be perfect, but I'm going to tell you what, mamas who love their babies are striving to be perfect, right? So then go ahead and stand with them. Now, when that baby hits puberty or about 12, 13, mom, you got to let go. Did you hear me? You've got to let go because the next six years are dad's responsibility. And dads have blown it. We've blown it. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? We've blown it. Because now it's our responsibility to teach our children, those young ones who are coming in, and after 12, spanking a child doesn't do much. It just hardens that back end. It hardens a spirit. It hardens the, that internal mechanism that wants to be there and be in control. So think about it. So in our children, at, during that six years, up to 18, 19, when they're going to go out of the home, Dad, you and I have a responsibility. Listen to me. I'm going to share some of my old soil laundry with you, but it's not easy, but it's necessary. And that's six to eight years, maybe seven. It's up to us to train our children to live godly in an ungodly world. And we haven't done that well. You know why? We're so wrapped up in our business. We're so wrapped up in our success. We're so wrapped up in proving who we are. We want to be successful in the eyes of the world. And God doesn't give a hoot about that kind of success. Oh, but I'm providing for my family. You want, me, you want me to tell you how a kid spells love? T-I-M-E. Amen. Are you going to give me time? Oh, I believe in quality time. Well, let me tell you what. God doesn't talk about quality time. He talks about time. And you know what I know? Quantity has a quality all its own. Our kids are not microwavable. They're crock potters. They need a constant absorption. You can take notes on that, Rufus. <laughs> Listen to me. Our kids need our time. Next to seeing us love mama and enjoying that life and those kids watching us, our kids need our time. If I had it to do all over again, I'd go back and I thought about this, and this is what I'm going to share with you. Probably may not even go any further than this, but time. I was successful. Sports, God blessed me. Paid my education almost took care of a living for me, and I am so glad I didn't go that direction. But I, if I had my choice, I would have. But God knew something was better. I never would have ended up here, I don't believe, if I'd have gone the other direction, if I was still healthy at that time. I went in the Air Force, and how many know that every kid wants to be more successful than their dad? That's the measure. I want to be more successful. My dad was successful as a pastor. I wasn't going into pastoring. So when I got into the Air Force, my heart was to be absolutely the best I could be. Not just for me. I just felt like I don't want to be second best. So I poured it in. 12-hour days, 14-hour days, weekends, cross countries, flying more and more and more. Here's what I want, you, I want to show you. 
I would, when I was home, and I wasn't overseas for a year and things like that, when I was home, I would arrange my schedule so that when Brody had a ball game, football, basketball, baseball, when Chris had gymnastics or she would have cheerleading, all that stuff, you know what I'm talking about. I'd arrange my schedule so I could be there. When they were recognized for their academic achievements and they were like three and four in their class, I plan on being there. Sounds like I'm a pretty good dad, doesn't it? No. The Holy Spirit convicted me when I was doing this sermon. What did I say to them was important? Now, we were in church on Sundays. We were in church on Wednesdays. We were in church often, many times, because I was a deacon. I was an elder in the church. I was young, but I was still there. And Ralph, uh, Ralph Painter was our pastor, and I loved him. He was one of the greatest teachers of the word I'd ever sat under. But I'd often come walking into the service at the end, still in a flight suit, having flown all day, but I made it in because I was trained that way, being church. Even if you only get five minutes or ten minutes. It's the way my parents did it. It's what they expected of me. Now watch this. What did I say was important to my kids? Huh? What? No. Nah. You know what I said was important to them? Your sports. Your academics. The, the things the world approves of. Are you listening to me, men? Listen to me. This is one of my greatest regrets. Is that I, even though I took them to church, we loved church. I said to them, I'll be there for your academics, your sports, and other things, but for the spiritual activities, for that spiritual functions that you go to, I may not be able to be there. Are you catching me? The Holy Spirit said, you allowed other people to set the standard for them. You allowed other men and women to speak into their lives about spiritual things that are your responsibility. And I had to ask God to forgive me. My kids love God today. Brody's in church. He's probably going to be a, a deacon this year. I, I, I don't know. It's not important in, in that realm. But what it says is when he was going through the struggles, there were, I was praying for him. And I was asking you to pray for him. And, and God has just done some wonderful things in his life. And Chris is loving God with her heart, her babies, and it's just neat. It's not done yet. But here's what I know. The spiritual things are more important than sports and academics and other stuff. And that's why where I am now. My kids are grown, but let me tell you what. I have not stopped praying for them. Neither one of us have. And another one of those things that I have a, a desire, if I could, I would change, I'd pray more for my family. Yeah, me too. Hmm? Me too. I would. Mm. Oh, not just their salvation. God saves them. He's done a wonderful thing. But, oh, God, fulfill their desire, that instinct of desire to serve you with all that's within them. Lord, burn that inside of their little beings, that their minds would dwell upon you, that their desire is to love you so passionately that the world will absolutely just reject them. Yeah. Isn't that what we pray? Come up here, Tyler. I want to bless our kids. I remember my dad blessing us. When I'd get ready to go to school, dad would pray a prayer of blessing over us. And then when I'd go to a new assignment, dad would pray, 
favor. Never forgot it. Let me tell you, you heard this young man preach. If you don't think he's got the anointing on him, let me tell you, I wish I would have encouraged my kids more. See, your dad couldn't do that because he's the associate pastor. <laughs> but when you finish preaching, I want to get up there and go, yes! It's my baby! Church, are you aware by the encouragement that you have given to others, by the, the power of God working through us as a body of believers, some who are not here today, many who have gone on to their reward like Steve and others? Do you realize that God has raised up almost at least 18 young men and women to preach the gospel and go into missions in this fellowship? Sweethearts, that's one a year. Keep the fire burning. Yes, sir. May the Holy Spirit just overtake you. Don't let anybody put it out. Don't let anybody, especially Christians. I'm serious. Too many Christians. You did good, but, but that's a back slap. Lisa, I won't say it, but there's times that I would love to let the, the spirit of <laughs> slap come up on me. I love you. I you Listen to me, church. <laughs> Encouraging our children into the spiritual things of God yes. is more important than encouraging our kids in athletics in academics, oh, I'm all for being smart. I'm all for, but you know what I know? There's only one smartest. There's only one greatest athlete. There's only one. Everybody else is a loser. <laughs> Isn't that the way it feels? You get all the way to the national championship, and in a split second, the ball game is over, and Carolina wins it. Yeah. And the glory of the Lord came down and filled. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm joking. But the other team, tears rolling down their cheeks. Grown men. Well, they're still teenagers, some of them. Brokenhearted that they didn't get the dream. And everybody gets in the mully grubs. And here's what I know. Spend time with your kids, but not just on the earthly things. The Bible says to share the word of God with them everywhere you go. Oh, that means something, men. That means that we have to know the word. That means that we cannot leave it to other people to raise our children in the things of God. God has given us that title, Father. Oh, God, may I be a real f glimpse of who the real father is. Brody did something to me this weekend. We've gotten into a discussion on how smart the GPS is compared to dad. <laughs> he took a wrong turn, according to dad. I says, that's not the shortest way. He said, that's the way the GPS says. I says, GPS ain't always right. But I'm going to follow the GPS, he said. He says, okay. See, I had wanted to go someplace else, which was the shorter way, but it went by Walmart so I could get something that I needed. <laughs> I didn't tell him that. You see where this is going, don't you? <laughs> we slide down onto 17. He can't take the quick turn that gets us straight over because there's too much traffic. I knew it would be there. Dads know that. So we had to go down another four or five blocks, six blocks maybe, turn in. We, I got my stuff at CVS qu twice the cost. We go on to the house. He said, Dad, and he's got, a spirit, he's got an attitude right now. I didn't. 
I could have agreed with him, but then both of us have been wrong. <clears throat> so we get in the house, and I said, let me talk to you about some spatial elements of life. He was not in the mood. I says, GPSs are not only always smarter than your dad. And then we get a call. There's been a terrible wreck right there at the intersection. If you guys had come that short way, you'd have been still sitting there. And he says, my Google map tells me that. I says, I don't care. <laughs> the Holy Spirit should have told me that, but he didn't. So he goes into his room. And Kathy, like the good wife, says, honey, you need to fix this. <laughs> but I don't want to fix this. <laughs> and she says, you need to fix this. Go make it right. I said, I am right. <laughs> that is not the answer she was going to settle for. So I go over to his room and I, hey, Brode, can I come in? <laughs> yeah, yeah, come on in. I says, honey, daddy was wrong, I'm sorry. That's really, then I wanted to run. <laughs> and he sat up in bed, tears welled up in his eyes. Oh. And we hugged each other. He said, Dad, thank you. Dad, don't let your pride keep you from sharing the love of God to your kids. And being wrong happens. I mean, know it. You mean to be right 100% of the time, but 80% of the time you might be right. The other 20%, we need somebody to forgive us. Let me tell you what. We need to be humble enough to go to our kiddos and tell them we love them and we're sorry. And even if you're not wrong, <clears throat> be big enough and man enough and godly enough to say, honey, I'm sorry. That's right, Pastor. That's right. You know, there's, I, this sermon's titled, If. In that case, I don't go to my son and say, if I messed up. No, no, no. Bite the bullet. Honey, I messed up. See, when God was dealing with me on those five, eight things, the heart of the matter is having a right attitude toward mama and a right attitude for our kids. And as I was holding my son, both of us with tears, he said something gently. He said, I'm so proud of you, Dad. What? <laughs> Let me tell you, I heard those words many times from my own father. Honey, your dad's so proud of you. What you stand for, what you live for. See, I had the, the glimpse of God the Father and my dad and my mom. Not everybody has. That was an outstanding video. But I want you to know something. God the Father is a good father. He loves you and cares for you. And he's proud of you. Oh, but my earthly dad's critical. No, no, no. If daddy doesn't give the image of God to you, then get your eyes off your earthly father and get them on your heavenly father. Loving God, who's at the center of your home. Loving mom, which is the greatest example you can show to your kids. Tender, to the family, tough to the world. Spending time with your kids, not just on earthly things, but on spiritual things. 
I made a commitment this week that I'm investing in not just the material things and the physical things. My grandbabies, God love them. I got a nine-year-old, Michelle. She got Kathy and I, and she says, oh, I want to get one of those princess things on. I want to get my hair done, and I want my fingers glistening, and we bit into it. <laughs> we go into this sparkles. Yeah, sparkles. They take all your money. <laughs> they sparkled her fingers. They look so cute. They sparkled her all over, and I'm thinking, I am out of the way. Here I am in a woman's place, a girl's place, and it's... Mm. So we're in there. This young lady takes her, and she begins to braid her hair as fast as I'm thinking, how do you do that? I don't have that much, but she did hers. It was beautiful. I mean beautiful. Worth every $30 you could give it. And I'm thinking, boy, she, her daddy's going to see her on Father's Day. Chris, if, Christopher, if you're watching this, you need to know it. That's her daddy. I'm so excited. Next morning we get together and we're going to have breakfast before we leave. In they walk late. If my daughter's coming, plan on her being late. Christopher, don't pay attention. But so here they are. And I looked at Michelle. I says, Michelle, what happened to your hair? She says, it didn't feel good. So I took all the bobby pins out. You what? You didn't even have that hair thing on for 30, for 12 hours, 24 hours. It's gone. And $30 is wasted. You can't fix stupid Grandpas are stupid. <laughs> I'm evidence. What am I saying? You know what? We'll do all kinds of things to please our children. And they have no eternal value. Are you listening to me? Every one of us have done this. You know what God's saying to me, to us as men, to fathers? It's time to get your priorities right. The most important thing is not my kid playing baseball on Wednesday nights and Sundays and missing church, and we act like that's the most important thing. Well, we can't miss it because the coach said, I don't care. Listen to me. I love sports, but my God is more important. I love academics. I love kids who excel, who spend time in the books. But I want you to know something. I want them to spend that much time with God too. Amen. God changed my life when I decided that I, as many books as I would read during the week, and I would read two and three, God quickened in me that for every book that you read, that even if it's a spiritual book, you, spend a, you read another book in my holy word to match it. If I read a thick book, I'll go to Isaiah. I'll go to other things and other large books. If I read a small book, I may go to Jude. I don't know. But I'm going to read another book to match the book that I just read. You know what I know? That book will change your life. These others can lead you down the wrong path. Even when they're good books. That changed my life. It'll change your life. You know why? Because you're putting spiritual things ahead of the earthly things. Sweethearts, and I say this to men and women, let us declare in our hearts that for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will focus on him before we focus on the things of this world. We are not concerned how we dress, how we eat, what we're gonna, where we're going to go, because the scripture tells me you don't have all the control. Let God guide you. Dad, today, maybe it's a day when you're with your kids and God brings back to remember some things that you ought to have done that you didn't do. Number one, you ask him to forgive you. Then ask them to forgive you. 
Really? When I asked Bro to forgive me, forgive me, and I didn't think I was really wrong. I was still wrong. Hmm? You want to be raised up in the eyes of your family? Walk in humility. Walk in brokenness. Walk with tenderness. Guard your tongue. Pray more, talk less. Listen to your babies. Isn't it amazing how our kids are chatterboxes when they are growing up? I, I sit with my three granddaughters. We're together. Chris is there. I don't know how Chris does it. God bless her. They all talk at once. Do you notice how that happens? Am I the only one? It feels like everything is, it is a bing, 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 and nobody is listening. Am I the only one? Thank you, Eddie. <laughs> and they're all catching the conversation. I'm thinking, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Grandpa, hang around. Sure. Here's what I'm going to try to tell you. When they get older, they quiet down, don't they? Yeah, they do. They would rather talk to their friends than to you. You think we've done something wrong? The fifth thing that I would have done, I'd have listened more. I'd have listened to my babies when they're chatterboxes. And I will, my grandbabies. I've already committed to that. I may not understand what they're saying. <laughs> Lord, help me. <laughs> but I'm going to listen to them. So that as they grow up, they know Grandpa's going to listen. When the world is caving in and things are not right, Grandpa's still going to listen. So is Grandma. And my children will know that Mom and Dad still listen. And you know what? As long as those kiddos' feet walk this earth, 43 to 83 to 93, whatever they are, I will never stop praying for my kids. Never. Dad, what would you change? If you could do it over again, what would you do differently? It may not be the same things I'm talking about. There's something that sings inside of you that says, I need to do something different. Here's what I do know. If Christ is not the center of your home, you are building with futility inside. If he is not the rock of your salvation, if he's not the foundation for your home, your home will crumble. Hmm? Fact. Fact. Make a decision to change. Make a decision. Let's pray. Father, we sit in your holy place. Lord, the world would look at us right now and say, we have got it together. We're in the house of the Lord. But there are things we've messed up. There's things that we have forgotten. There's things that we did not hold high value to. And we allowed other people to train up our children. Forgive us. Forgive me. So, Lord, give us that assurance. Men, in this moment, if there's things or thoughts that came to your, come to your mind that you would say, Lord, I want to make a change. I want to live differently. I want my kids to look at me and say, Dad, I'm proud of you. Dad, you're a man of love and grace. I don't even know how you still love me for all the things I've done. 
If that's you, I'm just going to ask you to stand where you're at. I just want to pray with you. I'm not going to put pressure on you. But if you want somebody to pray with you, would you stand right where you're at? And you say, Lord, there are things that I'd like to change. And today I'm making a decision. I'm going to make some changes. If that's you, right where you're at, stand. Right where you're at. You don't need other people to do it for you. Do it in your own strength. Are there things you might change? Because, see, you may not change them with your kids, but you can change them with your grandkids. Amen. Others, don't hesitate. This is not about religion. This is about our relationship with God the Father. Father, you see us standing in your presence. And, Lord, decisions have already been made. Those that are standing, Lord, I ask you to give them strength and courage and encouragement. May we build up one another in the faith that, God, we might encourage one another to hold on. Cast your bread upon the water like Stacy mentioned. Lord, it will come back. Lord, don't let us be influenced by everybody else around us. Let us do what's right. Because it's right. Because it's godly. Lord, let us choose to make the things of God more important than the things of the world. And we give you thanks in your precious name. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Barb, would you come up here a minute? I thought next week was Barb's last Sunday with us.